Welcome to the Love That Guy podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Ronnie Jean Blevins. And this is Brendan Reynolds. He got third all for billing at the end of each picture. That don't really mean much. He would say with a grin. But he held my hand tight when he pawned his name out. Only four or five names down below Errol Flynn. We are the show that celebrates the journeyman actors, the actors we all know and love. And even though we might not always know their names, we inevitably see them in film and television and think to ourselves, I love that guy. Hey, Ronnie, what's happening? Not much, man. Episode, Not, what are we on, 11 or 12? Episode, well, uh, we're on episode 11. We got uh, the great Spencer Garrett today. Yeah, exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Spencer's been fantastic, he's, particularly these last, like this last decade. He's been on a run. Yeah. yeah. Chick Hearn and, um, and HBO's Winning Time. And um, I'm just such a fan of him because, you know, we'll we'll get into this, but he just, he just, the, his whole essence is... Yeah. Is old Hollywood. Totally. You know? He fits that mid-century archetype so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, he even tells us that he plays a lot of real life people, which is yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, man. And and then, you know, of course, his, his mom was a, a big actress, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kathleen Nolan, and his dad was a Zach in a talent agency. So he was kind of born yeah. into it, you know? So we really, we really kind of go in, um, in this episode, mm -hmm. um, uh, to uh, to kind of you know the like the the Hollywood that I that I I learned from the pictures you mm -hmm. know from the seventies and eighties film era the classic you know? shit yeah, yeah. the well, classic the new Hollywood shit, too you know yeah. and it's like because uh, uh, he he reminds me so much of that vibe yeah the, the vibe of which I, I I never really kind of found you know mm -hmm. apart from like. Like, uh, you know, uh, like you got here a little too late. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, no yeah. more of a shit, more like, like 20, well, maybe. 20 years too late. Well, you, well, we will, we'll tease it a little bit, but Tarantino even had some interesting commentary about yeah. Spencer in that way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This yeah. is full of kind of like, uh, if you, yeah, it's kind of like, um, all the things that I loved about, uh, um, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood mm -hmm. and, uh, and the nostalgia that, that a movie like that gives you and, right. and also winning time, you know, yeah. uh, the nostalgia for LA and our business, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so appropriate that we have uh, Spencer on the show because it was kind of, it was kind of like coinciding to this, uh, to this feeling I've been feeling lately of mm -hmm. like, I'm, you know, I missed out on, <laughs> on like, <laughs> But you're still yeah. doing some pretty cool stuff. You just got off a really awesome Western project. I'm not talking about work. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking it's about the vibe, the, you know, the, the all the stuff outside of work because you know work yeah. is cool. Work, yeah, work, yeah. I, I work with some really cool people. Well, they don't shoot stuff anymore um, anyway. Uh, yeah, but I've <laughs> shot in four years. So it's like it's you crazy. know, like uh, I don't know, but um, yeah. you know, I, I uh, anyway. I, I don't. Let's just get right into it. Yeah, he's a classic. Yeah, yeah Spencer, Spencer Garrett, Garrett. and uh, enjoy. When I moved to Los Angeles nearly 25 years ago, it wasn't just to launch a career in entertainment. I was also looking for something. A vibe, if you will. You see, I've always been obsessed with films. I was a child of the 70s, so everything that I loved about movies and subsequently Hollywood was informed by the 70s and 80s film era. I was looking for Robert Evans at Dantanas and Jack Nicholson at the Monkey Bar. I showed up to L.A. to find Bukowski at the Frolic Room, what I found instead was Tiesto at the standard rooftop bar. Was I chasing a myth, or had the romantic version of Hollywood I had in my mind long since died off? My suspicion is both, because over 25 years, the times I spent amongst the vibe I've been chasing probably adds up to about one long four-day weekend. But our next guest has this vibe in spades. His essence is everything old Hollywood. Now, I will concede that it could be because he starred in the two of the most nostalgia-inducing projects of the last two decades, these two projects being Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and HBO's Winning Time. But it's more than that. It's an essence. Our next guest was literally born into Hollywood. Our next guest made his bones on shows like Dallas and Murder, She Wrote. He starred in movies like Bobby, Iron Man 3, The Front Runner, the list goes on. 
He's about to come out as the amazing Chick Hearn in season two, HBO's Winning Time. I'm obsessed with him on this show. Welcome to Love That Guy, an actor whose essence I've been searching for 25 years. The incomparable Spencer Garrett. Yeah, nice. We made it through. Wow. How you doing, buddy? Wow. I'm good. I'm not, not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> it occurs to me that if I you, were Rob. you and I had your, like, uh, incredible voice and diction, that would be a lot smoother for me. <laughs> you did a good job. That was the longest one you've done. <laughs> How you doing, man? You did an excellent... I'm, I'm great. I'm great. I'm so happy to see you guys. You look... Wherever you are, you look like you're in the green room of some jazz club in london somewhere <laughs> you look so like these beautiful plush velvet couches all right you should right. have a you guys should have a couple of martinis uh i know i know, I know. First you look so comfy it's, it's, yeah it's, it's, i could use I a couple it. of cold, good to see yeah. you both cool. thank yeah. you man same to you um and uh yeah i could use a cold beer right now i felt like i was about for some reason i was having breathing problems during that intro um so brother what <laughs> what have you uh, this romantic vibe in which I'm, I speak of, have you ever experienced like a, a sustained version of it in, in your time in LA or Hollywood? I, I'm searching for it too. I think yeah. along with you, I'm still, I'm still searching for it. You know, I, I, I've always felt like I was born in the wrong era. I, I felt like I was born in the wrong decade. I, I feel like, you know, in a parallel universe, I'm living in uh, in L.A. and New York in the 1940s, 1950s. Right. right. Um, my you know, my my dream experience would be to 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 come up in Hollywood as an actor in, you know, in the 60s and 70s and be a part of that, uh, you know, that sort of that Bob Rafelson, mm -hmm. you yep. know, that that magic time of, you know, all of those great movies with Nicholson and, you know, and Hoffman and that era when all of the greatest movies in my estimation yep. were made. Yep. Um, so I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still chasing that vibe. I'm still looking for that project. I'm still looking for that essence of, uh, of those kinds of films that, you know, we don't see anymore. So yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm I'm still hoping to run into Bob Evans and Dan Tanner. Uh, <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I actually got a chance to go with, uh, with, uh, a, a friend, uh, a friend, and someone else we've had on the show that the episode hadn't aired, but John Ashton, mm -hmm. uh, great old character actor. Uh, he oh played, wow! Played Taggart yeah, yeah, in Beverly Hills Cop, and uh, and we went, sure. uh, we went a few months ago, and 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 there was uh, you know James James Woods in the both mm -hmm. booth right really? here, and there's Dwight Yoko. I'm like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> it's a classic, <laughs> pretty cool, voice. man. So you're, uh, and and of course, you know, I I got to say Harry Dean, uh, who was always a touchstone for me and i don't know if you've seen it there's a wonderful i don't know how how easy it is to find there's a great documentary called character mm -hmm. um and it's harry dean stanton and dabney coleman nice. um it's probably about 10 years old and it follows harry dean and charles groden and um and dabney coleman and a couple of others and i remember when i first moved to la from new york in 1990 91 uh, and I would see Harry Dean play at the Mint, uh, oh, wow. and he used to do poetry readings at a place called place called Helena's, where which was like, you know, you'd see Sean Penn and Robert Downey, mm -hmm. you know, get up and do spoken word stuff and uh, read poetry, and like mm -hmm. that was the part of that world that I wanted to be part of. And Harry Dean, to me, is like the ultimate character actor, uh, wow. you know. So I, I, I so mean, when I see that yeah. picture, I just like, what an extraordinary career, you know. I agree, and I think that that's you know it. And the reality of it is um, that I, it, it, it all reverence to the great Harry Dean, and it could have probably been another, any other fifty hundred sure. excellent sure. Know, faces that just represent uh, this time period that we're mm -hmm. we're in search of. But um, so you know we we have a, a, a friend of ours, Sam Daly, who's the son of the great Tim Daly, and and he spoke of like being born to an actor parent. That um, you know, I said, yeah. what, what was it like being being born into that? And he's like, well, I always thought that everyone's uh, dad was an actor, <laughs> right. you know. So your mom is, of course, of course, uh, uh, Kathleen Nolan, and um, yeah. and uh, fantastic actor, you know, and uh, and she she was also the president of SAG, yeah. correct? Yeah. She was. She was. Well, thank you for saying that. First of all, she is a fantastic actor. She's going to be 90 in September. She's wow, still in the wow. ball game. Nice. Uh, she did her, 
I think she, her last film she did was about maybe five years ago, which turned out to be Burt Reynolds' uh, last movie, a lovely little film by Adam Rifkin called The Last Movie Star. I saw it. Turned yeah, it out it. to be one. Burt's. You saw it, yeah. And she played Burt's uh, the estranged wife uh, who has Alzheimer's in a nursing home. And that was, and she and Bert were old friends and they go back to the neighborhood playhouse in the 1950s. And it was a beautiful piece of acting from, from, from her and, and, and both of them really, these two old friends that have known each other for 65 years. So uh, she's, you know, she's, she's still doing it. She's still at it. And yeah, she was first woman president of the Screen Actors Guild in the 1970s. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of her. I'm very oh. proud to be a part of that legacy i'm at i'm a third i don't know how much how much uh googling you did but you know i'm my grandparents were actors uh my aunt and uncle were both actors i'm you know third generation my grandparents raised my aunt and my mom on a showboat on the mississippi river <laughs> in st louis called the golden rod that had a, had a theater on the showboat that used to go up and down the mississippi and and people from the towns like hannibal and joplin and st joe they would get on the boat and they would do theater on the boat and then it would go on to the next town and mm. So that's that, you know, that's, that's the, that's the essence that I came out of. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice family business to be a part of. Yeah. Oh man, it's, it's unbelievable. So cool. And do you, um, do you, do you feel that magic? Like, do you, when you, re, when you remember you, these formative years of being born into um, all these people in your family that were doing extraordinary things in this business, and I know your dad was a, a publicist and a talent agent, correct? Or just maybe just an agent. Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, no, he was, a, he was a, a publicist and a, yeah, yeah, and a manager and a talent agent. Yeah. Um, he represented a lot of uh, everybody from Vanessa Redgrave to Donald Pleasance and Oliver wow. Reed, a lot of English stars. Um, so yeah, I grew up around a lot of that too. Did you? Hmm. I could see how you would feel like maybe immune to its charm or romance. Do you when you think back on on when you can remember? Did you feel like, oh wow, this is this is magic, or did did that magic elude you at first because you were surrounded by it? Wow, that's a great question. Hmm. You know, I I think because I was around it as a kid, I was the, the life of an actor. As we know, it's it's a fucking roller coaster, and I watched. My mom, who was a television star in the 1960s, um, she was a, a, a pretty big star before I was born. She left a television series called The Real McCoys in order to have me. Mm. And then, um, you know, and then and then the roller coaster went down a little bit and then up and down and up and down. And then when she when she ran uh, SAG in the 70s, you know, she was battling against the patriarchy and, and this infrastructure of male dominated Hollywood mm -hmm. and she was bumping up against a lot of obstacles and her career uh, took a, you know, took a turn. And so I grew up during the time as a young kid, I grew up during a time where the work didn't come as easily wow. to her. And, you know, suddenly she was in her, you know, in her late thirties and forties. And, um, and so watching that and growing up, Sometimes we had money. Sometimes we didn't have money. Sometimes we did. And, you know, and I think my initial instincts as a kid, as a teenager, were to to run and to go do something else, do something stable, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go join the Foreign Service. Every wow. every instinct in my body said, OK, this is what this is. This is what you came out of. This is what you grew up into. It's wonderful. I was surrounded by creative fantastic people all the time I bet. I mean yeah I come home from come home from school and there's you know Jack Lemon sitting on the on the couch <laughs> wow, I mean, wow, been wild. and you know and I and I don't I don't I didn't take any of that for granted I knew that I knew that I kind of had this unusual existence as a kid I mean my my best friend was Laura Dern and my mom's best friend was Diane Ladd and wow. but <laughs> wow. they were just they were just they were just you know uh, Diane was just mom's mom's friend who happened to have the same job as mom. Right. Um, mm. you know, and, and so I think, I, mean, I think initially I was kind of like, I want to get a real job. I want to do something stable. And I, I kind of pursued that when I went to, I went to college, I went to 
Uh, I went to university to get my degree so I would have that thing to fall back on. And everything just kept pulling me back in. Mm. I worked in D.C. for a couple of years. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked for NPR. There were many times where I just thought, I'm, I'm, I've got to, I've got to do something. I've got to do something that is going to sustain me. Cause you know, this is not a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a tough life. And mm. so, but I just kept, I just kept getting drawn back in. Um, whether you, I mean, whether you call it the muse or whatever it is, I was doing all the plays in high school and doing the plays in college. And, and at some point I just thought, why are you fighting this? Mm. Why are you, why? Why are you why are you resisting this? Um, you, you were you were you were kind of born into this. Let's see if you're any fucking good at it mm, and mm-hmm. take a whack at it. And so, you know, I started doing theater in D.C. and then I moved up to New York uh, and did everything that I could possibly get myself into. Um, and I just started on the I just started on the roller coaster myself. I bought the ticket and I got on the ride and, you know, and I've been doing I'm 30, 35 years in. And I'm still trying to, still trying to figure it out. Still mm-hmm. trying to get good at it. Oh man! Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been I'm, a good bl- run. I'm blown away yeah. by you. And uh, and my, uh, you studied Meisner. Did you study with Meisner or or? I I did. I studied. I I got very lucky. I studied with with Mr. Meisner. Um, I remember going to him at uh, at 21. My mom studied with him. She was oh. in class at the neighborhood playhouse in 1955. Uh, right before she got, uh, she studied with him for a couple of years, and then she continued to study with him uh, throughout his life and 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 her life up until he passed away. Wow. She was a lifelong student of Sandy, so she said, "If you're going to study with anybody, you should go talk to Sandy." And I sat, I sat in his office at the Neighborhood Playhouse, and he said, "Get your college degree first, <laughs> and then come back to me." Mm, so I man. did. I came back, and he was he was smart, and he was right, and mm. I came back to him at. 23 or 24 and i started on my on my journey with sandy uh in classes at the playhouse and then i was with him at he had this island in the west indies he had a home on the island of Beckley wow. in the west indies cool. and i was there for a summer and then i was with him for about five six years out here in los angeles at playhouse west and he was my he was my guy and he just beat the crap out of me yeah. i mean he <laughs> was t- he was he was re- he was really really tough on me to the point where I remember calling my mom on the phone and saying I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Wow. And and she said Sandy's being hard on you because he thinks you're good. Yeah. Um and he eventually said that to me himself. I mean I was just, there were times where I just wanted to throw in the towel and quit because I didn't think I was any I was any good. And he pulled me aside and he said, you know, the reason I'm so hard on you in front of everybody in the class is because I see this kernel of potential in you wow. uh, and that's what obviously that's like that's what keeps you coming back right mm-hmm. right you know because i wanted i wanted i wanted to please him and i wanted to know for myself if i had it if i had it in me right if i if i had the goods right is is there anything hey, coach uh is there anything that you glean so profoundly um from him that you think about it every time you start a new job all the time. I mean, I think about him all the time. Mm. Whenever I whenever I step onto a set, um, it's and it, it's two words. It's be specific. Mm. Um, his, I mean, his his dictum was always be specific. Um, and if you know anything about Meisner, it's you know don't don't do anything until the other person makes you do it. Mm. I mean, they're all of these sort of maxims that he created. Um, but I, I, I always think back to my time in his classroom at, you know, 24, 25 years old, um, just super green, but just a sponge. I wanted to learn everything. And funny, I mean, listening, to, uh, listening to Chris Bauer on your podcast, a, a guy who I admire so much yeah. as, a, as an actor. As a, as a, he's, a re- he's really an artist. I mean, really, as, a, as an artist and a man and talking about, you know, you know, walking around as a young actor with a copy of Antonin Artaud in his, you know, in his back yeah. pocket <laughs> and reading every play. You know, I mean, that was me. I was reading every play I could I could get my hands on. I was a part. I had a, a play reading, a Monday night play reading group uh, at my house for years. Uh, 
Helen Hunt started a, a play reading group at, in her home that I was a part of for many, many years. And it was all these terrific actors. And we'd sit around and eat pizza and drink wine and we'd read a play and then we would dissect it and talk about it. Wow, man. You man, know, that's, that's the fun. stuff like when you're, you're, when you're, you're, you're a young actor, I mean, it, whether you are, whether you are bound for success or not, just to be, just to find your tribe and surround yourself with like-minded people that love the craft of acting as much as you do mm. um, to find those people when you're, you know, when you're young, um, that was everything to me. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, you know, you you still, you guys know, it's like being, being around people like that, 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 that nurture and, and help grow your desire and love of what you do is, uh, is, is everything. That's crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it it's really is. And it, it also sounds like the, you're, everything you're talking about is exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. Talking about Helen Hunt, and like this, this vibe that I'm talking about. Um, you speak about Laura Dern, you know, um, I, I, I did a, a movie with uh, Diane Ladd and we got close and I consider Bruce Darn a, a bit of a, a mentor to me and a, oh. a good friend. Yeah. Oh yeah. Done two yeah. films. Yeah. With yeah. Legend. yeah. Yeah. Legend. Um, what did you do with Bruce? I did a, uh, I did a movie that I actually wrote called American Cowslip and it, and it had, um, we got this, just all these legends, um, Incredible cast Bruce Dern, um, Rip, Torn, one of his last movies. Peter Falk, his very last movie. Oh my god! Uh, That's right. Yeah, it, it, god. it, it was. Uh, uh, Val, Val Kilmer, Kilmer yeah. played my brother. You know, it was a. Uh, it was called American Cowslip. It was a bit of a. Um, That's a it big was a, giant yeah. bowl yeah. of crazy right there. About. I mean, yes. Oh yeah. my god! Like it. And I remember. <laughs> I mean, wonderful, wonderful crazy. But, yeah. And I remember Peter, like Rip Torn, and and Diane Ladder just going at it and giving each other shit and and uh, and. And just Peter Fogg just <laughs> just back there laughing his ass off, you know, and and like I I I I saw, and this is probably a year before Peter died, and I looked at Peter and I just saw the joy he was deriving from seeing all the chaos. Yeah, that's so cool. Oh yeah, yeah. He's you like, know? Oh yeah. Look at these fools. Ethan. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, that, it's funny because you know, talk, I mean, Bruce Bruce was. Speaking of Burt Reynolds, Burt's, uh, mm. Burt's last film would have been Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, as you may or may not know. Wow. Um, yeah. And he was in rehearsals. I think he was a week into rehearsals. Bruce's part? Rehearsing that scene. with uh, Bruce's part. Oh, wow. And, and Burt, Burt, Burt was doing it. Uh, and from what I understand, in last movie star, Adam Rifkin wanted Burt to, to take his uh, his his toupee off his mm -hmm. airpiece and he was, he was going to do it and ultimately decided not to do it for vanity's sake or whatever. And then Quentin cast him in once upon a time. And, and he was playing, he was playing, you know, he was playing spawn. He was playing the old man at the ranch. Mm -hmm. And, and, and apparently Quentin said, you know, I, I understand you were going to take, I said, I need you to take it off. I need you to, mm -hmm. I need you to be bald in this thing. And he was going to do it. And I just, I, 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 as much as I am crazy about Bruce Dern and all of his work, what a, what a, what a wonderful thing it would have been to see, Bill, yeah. Yeah. you know, in that, in that film as yeah, well. Sure. But Bruce came in literally like at the last minute and, and just crushed it. Oh, wow. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's perfect. Just, just ex yeah. extraordinary extraordinary presence yeah. and uh mm -hmm. and peter falk is another buddy i, I mean I, I i have to tell a quick story about peter Please, falk yeah. only because he's somebody that i grew up i grew up watching on colombo grew up watching him admiring him as an actor not just in colombo but all in all the cassavetes films um i was that 10 11 year old kid who uh there was a thing in la called the z channel which was a precursor to HBO and, and, and cable where you could, you know, to, to the streamers. I mean, it, Channel Z in Los Angeles, it was a cable box and it was literally like A through Z. And if you pushed the right. Z button, it would take you to the channel on your television set where you could watch like Fellini films and Truffaut and like classic films. It was like Turner Classic Movies meets HBO. It was a sort of a hodgepodge. It was a fantastic channel. There's a documentary about it. It's great. And and I remember, you know, watching all of the, you know, seeing, seeing Peter Falk in these, in these great Cassavetes films. 
and getting a chance to work with him on a Columbo many, many, many years later uh, in the 90s. Uh, they rebooted the Columbo series and and I uh, they, they did a series of, of uh, like two or three movies of the week, like two hours of the mo- movies of the week. And I had an appointment to go meet Peter Falk in his office at the Black Tower Universal Studios. And I was 27, 28. I was very young, very green, hadn't done a lot of work at that point. And I just remember this was a big, big deal hmm. to me. And I hmm. went there. Patrick, Patrick McGowan, the great English actor, yep. uh, was directing the episode. And I sat down opposite him and I'm, I'm in Patrick's office. Peter's not there yet. And I'm having a conversation with him in about 15 minutes of the conversation. Patrick says, um, so I think, I think we've, I think we've found our Roger Gambles. I think we've, I, would you like to, would you like to come and play with us and me and Peter on the set in Colombo? And I said, yes, sir, I would. And he pushes a button on his phone. Talk about old school Hollywood, old rotary dial phone with the red buttons. And he pushes the phone. He says, Peter, come in here for a moment. And he says, I think we've found our Roger. Is the name of this silly character that I played. <laughs> Peter, come, Peter comes in, comes into the office. He says, how you doing, kid? I'm Pete. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Sits down. And Patrick McGowan pulls a drawer out of his desk, pulls out a bottle of scotch and three glasses. Wow. <laughs> Just like right up. Wow. Pours a shot into the glass. And he said, first shot of the picture. And, we, and I'm like, this is like, you know, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's 11, 11 o'clock in yeah. the movie, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I'm doing a shot of, you know, whiskey with Peter Falk and Patrick McGowan. Yeah, yeah. And, with Columbo you know, and Secret Agent, no, man. <laughs> forget about it. Yeah. I mean, no audition, just a meeting. And I thought, well, this is how it's going to go for the, you know, for the rest of my career. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to meet, I'm going to meet famous directors in their offices, drink whiskey, and I'm going to come out with a job. Um, well, that's pretty I mean, fucking old Hollywood, yeah, Spencer. Any, I was very, very fucking old Hollywood, yeah. and I just remember driving home in my in my Yugo. Um, you know, do you guys even know what a Yugo oh, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the shitty little Yugoslavian yeah. death, death box of a car, and I remember driving home on the 101. You know, like ripped on whiskey. You know, in the morning, <laughs> thinking, you know, to my crappy little apartment in Beechwood Canyon, thinking. I'm living the dream. Yeah, man. I made it. I'm living, you know. Man. Yeah, wow. man, I made it. And you know, uh, but that, that was just like yeah. so getting getting to work with, you know, and and how how beautiful for you that you got to work with, you know, Bruce and Peter. Amazing. And, and, Amazing. And then I know, produced another rip, film I mean, was, a few years back that I would I worked with uh, Bruce again with. But uh, Patrick McGowan, great actor. So 20 years ago, I'm bartending the. Uh, 6 a.m. shift at a bar called The Gaslight in oh, yeah. Santa Monica. Yeah. <laughs> Every morning, 6 a.m., yeah. Patrick McGowan comes in. Really? He starts bringing me. We become oh, friends. Man. He starts bringing me screen, screeners. Oh, we wow. develop this friendship. This movie Small that world. this movie that Peter Falk was in. Um, so we, after a year, he knows that I'm writing this script and that I want to produce American Cowslip. Yeah. So I, I I got up the nerve and said, "Listen, I'm you know we we uh, we're going to make you an offer. The casting director is going to make you an offer." Uh, uh, for this this role for, of the the priest in American Cowslip, and uh, and then he, he's like, oh man, I'm fucking retired, and, and, and I can't do his accent, but he's like, I'm retired, and he goes, so but he calls me, he goes, listen, uh, I I can't do it. Like I told you many times before, I'm retired, mm-hmm. but I uh, but I'm I I reached out to a buddy of mine. I want you to call him. It was Peter Falk. And that's how we got him to do it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's oh crazy. Oh my god. Small yeah. world here. Yeah. Yeah, Peter. I, I've wow. often wanted to reach out to. Uh, I didn't know Patrick McGowan's daughter, but I've wanted to reach out and just say what he meant to me, you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I don't know. That's I don't huge. even know. But he got. He actually got sober a couple of years before he passed, and and stopped coming into the bar. And he's yeah, like, you know, right. I really want to enjoy my grandchildren. But it's a stand up guy. He's he's yeah. told me some stories that I could never repeat that blew my mind <laughs> for another know? podcast. Yeah. Oh <laughs> my god. I mean, well, we we need to we need to have a cocktail. And yeah. I yeah. Can yeah. Hear oh yeah. <laughs> because that was, I mean, really. A, just an extraordinary experience for me. Just, I mean, being directed by Patrick, w- working with Peter, and seeing this guy who, you know, I mean, when you meet your heroes, you know, they say don't meet your heroes. Sometimes you meet them and they're everything you want them to be, and mm. sometimes they're not. And I've had a couple of knots with Peter. It was, he really, like, he took me under his wing. And this is a character that he'd done 
20, 25 years earlier that he was kind of bringing back out of mothballs. And I remember we were shooting at some house out in the valley, and I remember watching him from afar, just walking around on his own, kind of, you know, he was in character and he was doing the thing and he was like, you know, doing the line. He was running the lines so to good. himself. And mm-hmm. just, 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 just the, the work ethic. Um, so nurturing to me, uh, and and uh, just every day on set was was a joy with him. And I was just pinching myself every day. I still do, guys. I mean, it's 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 it sounds it sounds silly, but God, I'm you know 35 years into this to this gig. Every time I pull onto a set or walk onto a stage, or you know, I'm I'm in a green room and I'm setting up my makeup kit and all. I mean. Every time it's it's a it's a blessing and a gift. Every time I drive onto a lot, I think, God damn, how lucky am I to yeah. be able to do this? Yeah, it's exciting. You know, yeah, I think I, about that too, man. It's like light, like life is hard. Like right. I got I got chronic fatigue syndrome, except yeah. when I'm on set. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you tell me all the time. Yeah. The, hardest, yeah. the hardest part of the business is when you're not acting. Is everything else around? Well, it's everything else. The, yeah, yeah but, uh, you know, action between action and That's cut. The easy it, part. I mean, it's a, yeah, easy. Well, I mean, if you right. if you do the work, it's definitely the yeah. fun part, right? Yeah, right? But I never get tired, man. Yeah. I'm always there and engaged, yeah. and it's like everything else. It's like yep. trains me. That creative part is just yeah. inspirational. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It re- it really, really, truly is. And then working on a show like 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 Winning Time, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm looking over in the makeup trailer, and I'm like, holy shit, that's <laughs> Sally Field and John mm-hmm. C. Riley. Oh, cast. And you know, when you like, you get to the point where you you're working creatively with people that were your heroes as a kid, and people or just people that you've admired, you know, on on screen. It's I I, I it I have pinch me moments all the time where. I just feel so lucky to be able to do this. Well, yeah, I'm cool. having a, uh, I, I, I'm wondering, cause I kind of perceive you as a star. Um, 10 years ago, did you, could, could you have imagined that you would have five years, like the last five years yeah. have been for you? I mean, it's been a great run, run right? Been incredible. Yeah. No, I didn't. I, and, and I, and but 10 years ago, I was, I was probably going to hang it up. Uh, there were, there were a couple of, there were a couple of times, well, during, uh, during the writer's strike, the last writer's strike, 2008, um, mm-hmm. 2008, I was, I was, uh, so I, I started, let's say I started really in earnest as an actor professionally, I would say 20 at 26. Okay. So, you know, late eighties. Right. Right. Um, and it started about 80, 85, 86 and came out to L.A. chugging along, you know, gig here, gig there, a little momentum. You know, you're on the roller skate, roller coaster, you know, you know, and then, you know, and, you know, I mean, you know, you know the deal. And then 2008, the writer's strike comes along. and Pretty good groove. And I'm I'm at Paramount. I'm carrying a picket sign with some writer friends. And this is like week five, and I'm thinking, "Fuck, this is going to go on for a while." I wow. need, to, I need to, I need to, you know, figure out a plan B. And I went back, I went back and and worked at a restaurant for the first time in 20 years. Um, I went back to the guy that owned the restaurant that I, that I started at when I first moved here in '89. Uh, it was this great guy named Larry Nicola. He had a restaurant in Silver Lake called L.A. Nicola mm. before Silver Lake was Silver Lake. And I remember I picked it because it was like off the beaten path. It was outside of Hollywood. It was sort of on the fringe. And I didn't have to worry about, you know, casting directors coming in. And, you know, it was like mm-hmm. it was not an industry place. Mm. So cut to 2008. He's got a place in Beverly Hills called Nick's Martini Lounge, mm. uh, which is this sort of fancy upscale. It was a great spot. Yeah. And so I walked in and I walked in and, and he's like, oh, my God, because like, he fired me 20 years earlier. <laughs> he's like, oh, my God, I'm so proud of you. Like, Aww. you're doing so great. And it was lovely. And I said, Larry, thank you. That's great to hear. I said, I need a, I need a job. Whoa. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I, you know, I said, you got something you got something I can do. And he said, can you make a martini? And I said, <laughs> sure. And he said, great, go home. So I literally, like, long story short, I ran home. Grabbed a suit, came back, 
and he gave me a gig as the maitre d'. I'm working at the maitre oh, d' nice. as, as wow. the maitre d' at Nick's Martini Lounge. And I worked there for like four months, and I was literally like thinking, eh, maybe when they offered me that gig in the drama department at Duke University <laughs> – 15 years ago maybe that's looking pretty good right now yeah. and i'm 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 hosting i'm at the i'm 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 bringing in casting directors and producers mm -hmm. and it was it was humbling but it was also sure. kind of great because i i i used it as an acting exercise mm -hmm. um i just i just decided to play different characters every night so i'd be i'd be the host oh, nice. at the maitre d stand and i'd say oh, good evening mr blevins I, you know, your <laughs> wow. table is waiting and i you know and I would just, I just come up with these stupid characters. And then in the middle of that, I got public enemies. Wow. Um, oh, cool. Wow. And that kind of like, that kind of like, that, like, that yeah. was like, that was like, but th thank you. I mean, that was a, that was a game changer. I mean, that was like, that was kind of, that kind of put me back in it. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see where this goes. And mm -hmm. that was sort of the beginning of, right. you know, a, a, a pretty, a pretty nice run. I kind of, I got into a, I got into a sweet spot in my mid forties. Right. And, um, yeah. And you've been off to the races ever just, since. Yeah. You, what, what is it? I got to imagine, Oh God, I got to like, like my synapses are just firing here. I, one, I want to know, um, I imagine doing that scene. I can just with, with, uh, you know, the scene you have in once upon a time in Hollywood, I can just see t Tarantino, like, just being excited oh, just about watching it, yeah. it you yeah. know did you get that vibe from him i i did it was really it was really lovely i had not i didn't audition for him mm -hmm. i put myself on tape with a wonderful you know victoria thomas mm -hmm. who terrific casting director she sort of became a fan a while back and was bringing me in for everything and i remember reading for that in her office just she and i and she gave me a couple of notes and i remember walking out of there thinking I'm going to get this. Mm. It just had a feel. I just, just had a feeling like, I just felt like, you know, it's just that period I was playing my uncle, Chris, my, my mom's brother-in-law, my aunt's husband was a guy who did commercials in the 1960s. And he sounded like this mm. and he talked like this and, you know, uh, you know, old gold cigarettes, uh, you know, Budweiser beer. He had this voice. And so that's the guy that I did. And I, and I walked out of there and I thought, yeah, this, uh, this, this could be, this could be a, a good, a good one. And, you know, eight months, eight months went by, right. six, eight months went mm -hmm. by. And I get a call and they're like, oh, you got manager calls and said, you got the Tarantino thing. <laughs> I said, Holy shit. And I, and I had a fitting and I walked onto the set and that's where I met him for the very first time. And I walked onto that cowboy Western town mm -hmm. set and there's Brad and Leo and, I'd met various times over the years and it would, it all happened so fast. Mm. It was literally like sit down in the chair, you know, coverage wide. The whole thing was like in an hour. Wow. And right. he was, he was brilliant at the end of that scene. Like he came up to me, he's like, Holy shit. Huh. It's like, it's like a spaceship. <laughs> it's like a spaceship came, picked you up in 1967 <laughs> and dropped you under my set at Universal Studios in 2019. It's amazing. Like he was just so, that's, he was so yeah, Tarantino. So cool. yeah. It was like, that's, um, that's how I felt great, watching he, it, man. Yeah, you feel so you authentic know? in that. I mean, that role. it's just that that movie's just fucking bleeding with yeah. nostalgia. That's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, that's you, you know, knowing that we was going to, uh, we were going to talk to you thinking about your work, you know, thinking about who you, who you are, where you come from, what you've done and, and these being in these nostalgia pieces. That's what kind of got me thinking of, well, like the vibe. I, this is a rare century. thing. You know yeah. what I mean? A lot of it's some, something else. But, um, so I also wonder, um, because, you know, Tarantino has such an encyclopedic knowledge of, mm -hmm. of actors. Uh, I, I bet he was excited to find out who your mom was, right? Well, I'm sure he knew. Or did he know? Yeah. He 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 knew he knew who my mom was, and uh, <laughs> at the end of the scene, he said, "You know, this thing needs a button. It needs an ending." He said, "We he said, like I haven't written it." He said, "You need a sign off. You need a goodbye." Oh, yeah. And he said, "Can you come up with something?" And I remember saying, "Well, you're the writer. You come up with something." And he said, "No." He says, hey, "Just just come. Just just wow. just ad lib something, well, and amazing. we'll and we'll film it." And I said, "Well, you know who." You know who my mom is? And he said, yeah, your mom is Kathleen Nolan. She was on the Red McCoys. She was Wendy and Peter Pan. But he went down this long list. 
He knows the I whole said, yep, resume. you, you, you got it. You know, and like he's, a, he, it's yeah. like, he, it's crazy. Yeah. He's like a rain man with the, yeah. and so I said, um, I said, I'm going to try something. And so I said, join us next week on the set of the real McCoys, where I interview that beautiful and talented <laughs> redhead, Kathy Nolan. I love man. it, man. This is Alan so Kincaid cool. from Hollywood. And he's like, holy shit, that's amazing. And, you know, and he said, give me two more. He said, give me Phil Silvers and uh, and and uh, Dick Van Dyke. And I said, let me guess, because K is funny. Dick Van Dyke. He said, you got it. And so he said, give me Maury Amsterdam and Rosemary on the Dick Van Dyke show. So I did I did a little homage to my mom. And I did another one with Phil Silvers on Sergeant Bilko. And they kept and Maury, then I right? did join us. And then he kept Maury Amsterdam. And I remember and he came up to me to me at the premiere and he pulled me aside he said we we couldn't use the take with with your mom because the real mccoys was like two years earlier than bounty law right right. like it didn't it didn't work out chronologically i'm like oh shit um but i said that's okay Mm. i said am i still in the movie he said yeah you're still in the movie (laughs) wow so what did that mean to you that whole experience yeah i guess it's a broad question but oh actors that are referenced in Time period. I mean, that's the time period that I grew up in as I was a kid. And so it just, it was a love letter to the actors that I, to the industry that I grew up in and the actors that I grew up around. I remember when, uh, I remember when the Brad and Leo or they're watching his episode of FBI Mm. and, and Leo references, he's like, Oh, Bobby Hogan, great guy. He's referencing an actor in the episode that he was doing. I was like, Bob Hogan. That was a guy that I grew up around, Wow. you know, with my mom when she, you know, I mean, just, just stuff that's, like that. Little crazy. Easter eggs like that, that just meant, you know, just, just meant the world to me. So, and I, and I also remember that I'll, I will always remember walking onto that set. And as I'm walking forward and Brad and Leo were already in those chairs and they were sitting there smoking. And I remember feeling like, so I, for some reason, I felt, oh, I just got invited to sit at the grown-ups table. Wow, <laughs> wow. And, you know, and uh, you know, and I sat down with those two guys opposite them, and Brad kept looking at me, and he said, he said, he said I know I've seen you in a million things, man. He said, have, have we worked together before? And I said, you don't remember this, but and you you referenced it earlier, Ronnie. You said Dallas, for fuck's sake. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, you don't you? I said. And I said, you and I were on the last three episodes of Dallas. He's like, holy shit. Did we, did we have any scenes together? I said, no, we didn't have any scenes together. And, you know, and Brad Pitt was this young 20 year old kid off the bus from Missouri. Mm -hmm. And he did a couple of, a couple of episodes of Dallas as a guest, guest star. And, and all of a sudden I'm talking to these two guys and they are talking about, Brad says to Leo, he said, did you ever do a, a Matlock? And and, and Leo says, I didn't do a Matlock, but I did a Falcon's Crest. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm talking to the two biggest movie stars in the world. Yeah. Wow. And they're talking about how ma- how they made their bones so doing guest shots. Wow, man. You know, wow. But I'm, you know, you know and on Dallas and Falcon Crest. And, you know, Leo was on Growing Pains. Mm-hmm. And Brad did a couple of failed pilots. And all of a sudden, I suddenly felt put at ease because I'm just, we're just three character actors sitting around. Yeah. Unreal. Shooting the shit, talking about how we, yeah. And, and it, it, it was... Uh, the whole, literally the whole thing. I had a 7 a.m. call. I probably got there at 4 because I was so excited. And <laughs> went through hair and makeup. And I literally, we shot the scene and I was back in my back in my car an hour later. And I remember James Remar, the great James Remar. Yep. Uh, he was waiting. He was waiting, waiting in the wings, sort of getting ready to do his little bit where he gets punched by, uh, by Leo. He had, a, he had a quick little sort of cameo. And as I was, I finished the scene and I'm walking back to my trailer and Remar pulls me aside. He's like, dude, that was fucking great. And I just felt like, I don't know why. And this, you know, it's like, years ago, and I suddenly felt like I just kind of graduated. It was like, I felt like wow. I gradu- I got my master's degree. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, you know, Major bones. And, and it was just, it was just, a, it's a nice feeling. Major bones. Yeah. Does, um, yeah. I got to imagine, uh, Adam McKay got inspiration for your version of Chick Hearn from that, right? Or no? Uh, that's that. That's the rumor. Um, I met McKay. 
Mayor of Vice, and I didn't know him. I walked up to him. I love that movie. I love Christian in anything. Um, Christian Bale is another actor for mm-hmm. me that I just a touchstone actor for me. Just such a, a, a just an incredibly committed artist. Um, a really just complex plays these complex characters yep. and really, really does his research. And I just admire him so much. And again, and a lovely guy. And so I, I went there to see him and, and Sam Rockwell, another guy I admire. Mm. And I went up to McKay and, and I said, you know, I love the movie. He's like, he's like, I know you like, you're that guy. You're that guy. You're like, <laughs> right. you're that guy from that, that thing. Guy, yeah. I said, that's it. That's my, that's my tombstone. Love that guy. <laughs> and he said, did you read for me on this? And I said, no, actually I didn't. He, I, he said, he said, well, you weren't on my radar before, but you're on my radar now. And I was like, fuck yeah. Okay. Good nice. to know. And cut to, I guess, two years later and once upon had come out and um, it turns out my manager occasionally plays basketball with McKay. Mm. Uh, McKay's a huge hoops fan. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and he said, uh, you know, I've got this, you know, Spencer Garrett, uh, who's in the Tarantino film and he plays this guy that's kind of this announcer guy and McKay was like that's it bring him in wow and I remember I remember going out and finding like a polyester like a vintage polyester suit with a big fat ugly wide tie (laughs) I dressed as 70 as 70s as I possibly could and walked into the room and I had this long monologue Uh, it was a it was a scene with uh scene with Pat Riley, and then a long monologue where I'm just calling the games. It was just pages long of, you know, me saying magic to Kareem, Kareem to Cooper, Cooper to move, mm-hmm. Cooper loop, slam dunk, all of this. So good. And That's I got great. about, I got about like three minutes in and, uh, and, and McKay was like, That's it. You're, I'm done. And I, and I was in a way I walked out of the room feeling like I just kind of dropped a grenade in the room. <laughs> Man, and, like, uh, mic drop. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, when, when, when I hear these, um, uh, I don't want to be controversial here, but when I, I'm a fucking huge fan of this show and I can't wait oh, for season two. And so the shit awesome. you do with, Brandon, yeah. with Agent Brody makes yeah. you laugh yeah. so hard. But I, when I see these real life folks with the Lakers organization um, get like bent about the show, yeah. I think to myself, <clears> Jerry <throat> Jerry thou, thou protest too much. <laughs> yeah. They must be hitting a nerve, man. Yeah. The Jerry <laughs> they must West be getting letter. something right. You know, yeah. Yeah. and why are they so upset? Uh, who plays? Who plays? Uh, not Bus, but who plays? Uh, Jerry West. Uh, yes, who plays West is uh, uh, what's his uh, name? The British actor. Jason Clark. Yeah, yeah Jason, Jason Clark. Clark. Jason yeah. Clark. Like all these guys are coming off like people who care. You know, right, like right. they're they're lovable characters. I don't get it. Yeah. Why be upset? It drives me. You guys, it drives me bananas. Uh, Jason is uh, Jason. I know. I've known since Public Enemies. He's an old right, pal. Right, right, that's yeah. right. Wonderful, right. wonderful actor. Great actor, and it's you know, if if we if we had taken Jeff Perlman's Showtime book and just made a straight ahead drama mm-hmm. about the inner workings of the basketball world and magic shows, if it wasn't Adam McKayified, nobody would give a shit. Right? You yeah, know, yeah. it's it ne- it needed it needed that Adam McKay zhuzh. It needed that extra magic. No pun intended. No yeah. pun intended. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, Jason plays Jerry West. It's a heightened version uh, as as Jason Siegel, who uh, another guy I just love so to mm-hmm. pieces. So good. And he plays he talked about uh, uh, he had an interview with Pete Hammond the other day and he was and Pete was asking him about shrinking. And they were talking about his portrayal of Paul Westhead on the show. And Jason was like, listen, everything is heightened. It's everything. Everything is like kicked up a little bit of a notch. And I remember talking to Jason during the week when Jerry West said that he was going to sue HBO mm-hmm. in the Supreme Court <laughs> and he was going to take Adam McKay to the Supreme Court. And I just thought, oh, Jesus. God. You know, and, and while I, I'm talking to Jason on the phone and he's sending me screenshots of Jerry West's <laughs> autobiography where it says, one day I was on the golf course with Magic and Kareem and I got so pissed off that I shanked a hook off into the woods and I and I broke my golf clubs <laughs> over my knee and I threw them over the fence at the Bel Air Country Club. If you don't believe me, ask Pat Riley. He was standing right there. So like he's sending me like pages right. of yeah. receipts from his own autobiography. Um, right. 
people need to lighten up. Well, plus, yeah. it's, uh, if you really open your heart to it, you see that it's a fucking homage, and it's really, yeah, I mean, it's really beautiful, man. It's a really, it's a it homage is. to these His people. His character's a lot of humanity. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, interesting. It did, is, does, yeah. Does yeah. Chick, did Chick Hearn really uh, yield that much authority, I wonder? Yeah, he did. I mean, he was, I, it's, I don't know that it's, uh, documented as much as 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 i would like it to be on the show <laughs> but um duh <laughs> because i as i found out pretty quickly it's not the chick hearn show um <laughs> but when i i'm i'm developing my own spinoff called chick after dark and we'll talk about that <laughs> yeah, i tell you what i, I would watch that. the chick hearn show sure. you're a fan <laughs> so good. chick hearn chick hearn with a few martinis at musso and frank's yeah. after a laker game i love it yeah just letting it rip um but yeah, I mean, he was a GM. He was a co-GM of the team. Oh, that's right. Uh, he was instrumental. I mean, you know, Pat. I, I didn't realize Pat Riley was his his was his like go for. Pat Riley yeah. was like his side. I mean, he was color man, his side man. But all of this stuff with the fisting and all of that, <laughs> that's all accurate. That's my favorite scene. So yeah, good. And everything I've ever done. So I love it. You know, you'll know when you like. There are memes out there. There are gifts. You know, you'll know yeah, when yeah. you're being fisted. That's yeah. that's when you know that you that's yeah. when you know you've made your little yeah. footprint on the zeitgeist. Yeah, when yeah. you got a little gift of you, you know, like shoving your fist up somebody's ass. You're so um, perfectly condescending yeah. it, it, to him as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like uh, I, I I know you you probably can't say anything about season two, but have you shot it yet? Can you say that? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah yeah! It's coming out. Uh, I want to say August. August sixth. I saw the oh, tr- promo. Soon. So obviously, yeah, oh, wow. of course you, yeah, you yeah. shot it because I saw yeah, the yeah, promo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. wrapped in. Uh, we wrapped in February. It's all I can tell you is buckle up. Yeah, wow. it's, it's gonna be exciting. It's a, I mean, it's it's gonna be great. It's uh, it's even better than season one. I've seen a lot of it. I'm about to see a hell of a lot more of it because I'm actually going in next a week a week from today. I'm going in. Um, they save all of chicks. Uh, calling color commentary, um, all of the all of the games, all of the calling, the announcing, the games mm. uh, we do usually like the last day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going in to do a looping for um, for about eight hours uh, a yeah. week from Friday. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm going to be on vocal rest all next week, and then I'm going to go in and just oh, nice just just go crazy check. It's so exciting! But it's great. It's going to be great. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm psyched too. And um, you know, and again, it's like. The best number one on a call sheet I've ever worked with. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, you know, it's just like the 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 uh, the the tone is set from the from the top mm-hmm. down, and the the writing is gorgeous. And any 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 excuse me for me to put on vintage period polyester clothes <laughs> and sit in a makeup chair for three hours and get my face transformed. I mean, you know, you know that I don't look like this on the show i mean i look yeah mm-hmm. um they put on the nose and the ears and the chin and the wig and all of that i love it all i love it oh, all man i'm in there at five in the morning i sit there for three hours i come out i'm a totally different guy i mean that's that's the uh that's that's the the fun part of the job is mm-hmm. is getting to transform and and play somebody that you're that you're not because you know oh. I, I hate myself <laughs> 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 I'm curious as a non-actor for you actors, yeah. um, the, the difference between preparing for a, a real life person like Chick Hearn or Sean Hannity you played as well. What's yeah. that like as opposed to just taking it, creating a character raw off the page? You know, me of, you can hear his voice, you can watch footage of these guys. It's got to be a whole different process. I played a lot of real life guys. Yeah. I, 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 there's there's got to be a record. I, I, I'd like to think that I'm in a record book for having played played joe mccarthy yeah, i mm-hmm. played tom delay mm-hmm. i played bob woodward um some, some you know sean hannity mm-hmm. some some guys are really good guys like chick Hearn. <laughs> some guys are not so good guys like yeah. joe mccarthy you got to go in i mean part of the secret is you have to love them or you have to love all yeah, of them you right, can't judge despite. them before you go in sure um I, I all of my judgments about sean hannity i had to put them aside mm-hmm. You know, leave him and leave him in my trailer when I walked onto the set. Did you get to um, meet him? God no. Uh, Hannity, I had an opportunity to meet Hannity. And you turned. It I down. was offered to meet. Yeah. I, I was offered to meet Hannity, and I I turned it down. Yeah. Um. And I apparently I missed a really great steak lunch at Delmonico's <laughs> in New York because apparently like he's he's a huge tipper and he, like he's a bit like every lunch yeah. is like steak and lobster and martinis. Right. 
that part of it would have been fun, but I, I would have, I would have had to take taken the longest shower I've ever taken. Yeah, really. yeah I get after it. After that lunch, <laughs> get it. I get it. Man. Um, <laughs> so I, I, tur- I turn that down, and um, um, but Bob, but Bob Woodward, um, Bob Woodward, I did meet, uh, which was which was lovely, and you know, a hero of mine. But yeah, I mean, you um, for the front runner, front runner, you've yeah. got to put your judgment aside. Um, yeah. uh, Joe McCarthy, my, I, I got called. I I, might, I must have been a a last minute replacement because I in a million years I never would have thought somebody would hire me to play Joe McCarthy. Mm. It's a show called Timeless, and I think I got the call on a Monday. I was in Vancouver on a Wednesday, and I was shooting on Thursday. And you know McCarthy was like bald and heavy, and um, and so I just did this sort of deep dive into you know finding the voice and the right. cadence and mm-hmm. all of that, and tried to play play a version of him as, as best I could. Sometimes you, as you know, Ronnie, like you don't have time to, uh, you know, with episodic television. Sure. Um, there was another wonderful, there was a character of Walter, Walter Ruther, uh, who was the head of the United Auto Workers. Um, big, big time union, union man, union organizer, uh, head of the, head of the auto workers in the 1960s during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Jay, Jay Roach, who's a guy that I love and I've worked with a few times, uh, asked me to play him in uh, the movie version of All the Way with Brian mm. Cranston, mm-hmm. who played LBJ, who, you know, again, right. just another 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 master class. Watch that guy play yeah. LBJ. Um, yeah. You know, I just I I, I, I I stand in awe of these guys. I watch these these guys that are just just next level. And I just I just aspire to get to where they are. But I I I did. I had a couple of weeks to research Walter Ruther for one scene. With Anthony Mackie, who played LBJ, or who played, uh, sorry, uh, Martin Luther King, yeah, yep. um, played MLK wonderfully, and um, and I, I somehow, Walter Ruther's nephew was a documentary filmmaker named Sasha Ruther, who followed me on Twitter, and I DM'd him on Twitter, and and I said, what, it's this is crazy, but I said I'm about to play your uncle in a movie in about a month. Wow. And he sent me this documentary that he'd made about his uncle and gave me a bunch of books to read. And that's the stuff that, you know, we love as actors. I mean, I I, I got to do all of this great, great research into this guy that I knew I was going to be on screen for one or two scenes just to, um, just to, because I wanted to, I wanted to honor this guy. And and I want to honor Chick. And I, I met his, uh, I found out about a month before I started the shooting the pilot. You know, we did the pilot in 20, 2019, in the fall of 2019, and then COVID hit, right. and we got shut down for a year and a half. So there was a whole lag of a year wow. before we actually got into season one. Mm. So I got to know Chick's granddaughter. I found out that my old agent, a guy named Harry Abrams, was uh, Chick's agent for 40 years. Wow. And so he put me in touch with Chick's granddaughter and I went and had lunch with Chick's granddaughter and she showed me scrapbooks and photographs and, and, mm-hmm. you know, home movie footage and all of that. And of course I had an entire year to sit on my couch and watch YouTube videos. Right. And I got to the point where I'd be, I would, I would be watching a game. I'd be watching a Lakers <laughs> game and I would turn the volume down. Psychomic. I'd just be sitting on my couch wow. like a, like a crazy person. Yeah. And I would be doing, and I would be doing the, the, you know, the color commentary as Chick alone in my living room <laughs> during COVID. Um, oh, man, that um, must have been fun. Call it, calling the games in my living, at, at the top of my voice. That's incredible, yeah. man. That's, That's so cool. So incredible. Um, well, we, we, we don't have much longer, but I want to, uh, I want to know where you think, where you, when you predict we're all going to get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. That's a that's a that's a that's a tricky conversation. Or what do you think, think the producers um, are going to come back to the table? I, I guess is the first step, right? I right now I would say at least another month. Mm. I think we're I think we're gonna we gotta we gotta dig our heels in mm-hmm. for at least another month. I think if the if if SAG because SAG obviously you know SAG after voted to strike overwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we should because if we don't get what we what we're asking for now, right. um, between, between 
the threat of AI, which is very, very real mm -hmm. and very, very much here and very present, um, and and streaming residuals, uh, it's it's going to cause a world of hurt yeah. for uh, an enormous amount of people. And the fact that the the CEOs of these major corporations uh, are not giving an inch mm -hmm. uh, is is very, very telling and very troubling. And, yeah, uh, right. and it's. And it's and it scares me. It almost so seems I'm, like I'm hope it almost seems like they're playing a game with it's, it almost seems they made the deal with the DGA. Mm -hmm. The actors have been uh, negotiating for for a few weeks now for whatever that means. It almost seems and I don't I absolutely do not know shit, mm -hmm. but it almost seems like, well, if we can break one union, right. let's let's negotiate with the actors. Let's get a deal with the DGA and then let's villainize the WGA. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's I, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, directors but. You're not you're not you're not far off. You're not far off. I mean. The DGA tends to typically make the deal first. Mm -hmm. They they tend to cut a deal first. Um, I I got a lot of respect for the leadership there, and obviously worked with a lot of them. But I feel like there's more of an existential threat sure. now than than there was in the right. last negotiation. Um, the protections that we got as actors and that the writers got last negotiation last time around are are not sustainable they're not they're not mm -hmm. there now because we weren't talking about streaming back then we were talking about protections for uh protections for network residuals um you know they were covering network television residuals streaming wasn't that big of a thing you know, in the last round of right. negotiations right so the last day was dvds like right it was my, dvds i think was the sticking it was point DVDs, mm -hmm. and we got like we got 20 cents for every 400 dvs dvds sold Right. Um, the, the technology has gone yeah. miles ahead of that since then. I feel like the DGA you know, kind of swooping in two weeks in and cutting a deal, uh, I feel like is, is kind of hurt our, yeah. our bargaining quick. power. Yeah. And, and, and that, uh, it's frustrating to me. So yeah. I hope I'm wrong. Um, and I hope we all get back to work soon because yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's hot out there on the picket line, man. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm out there, uh, I don't want to go back to work. I, I can't go back to work at Nick's Martini Lounge. It's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, they closed the show. <laughs> I, I don't think you're in jeopardy, man. No, I yeah, think you're that a good spot. Uh, yeah. Well, listen, yeah, man, I want to labor. thank you so, so much. This has been like so fun. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. Very cool. I can talk, I can talk to you guys for hours. I, I love this. And I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you reached out to me, Ron and Jean, and asked me. I, I really am. And, and uh, I have to take issue, though, with one thing. Uh -oh. You... In one of your podcasts, you said Eric Lang is the most underrated actor in Hollywood, <laughs> and I and I I I, I got I got to feel like yeah yeah yeah, yeah I got <laughs> so, yeah, it. Well, second to you, uh, uh, yeah, obviously I'm the second yeah, mo yeah. second most underrated. Yeah, um, and you know, and uh, but you guys are tied. Listen, yeah. we're tied. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Um, um, yeah, man. Uh, well, we have to do it again. Listen, and, and I, I would love to any yeah, any time. And I, I I I aspire to be as as uh, deep and spiritually connected as Chris Bauer because oh, man. that guy's a, as a beast of an actor. I admire, yeah. I admire actors. I love actors. I love actors. I love acting. I just, I love being a part of it. And I, and I feel, I just feel lucky to be a part. It sounds very Pollyanna ish, but I, I really do. I feel, no, no, I feel no, lucky genuine. to be yeah. still that, doing it. And I, and I, you know, the moment it stops being fun is when it's time to hang it up, but it's guys like you that keep, you know, that keep, uh, the spotlight on guys like us, on actors like us. Yeah, you know, man. we're the character actors. We're the we're the character actors are the lifeblood of mm -hmm. yeah. of uh, you know of this of this of this industry. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, everything. So thank, come, you, thank you both yeah. for keeping it alive. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, listen, I, I could go on and on, man. Uh, uh, but you, you, it's your love and your purity that comes through. Everyone's got the thing, and that's what. That's that's what why people keep hiring you. Talent is mm -hmm. obviously they're not going to hire anyone that's untalented right. on a consistent basis. No one who who has a career for four decades is gonna you know mm -hmm. it, that's no accident. But the uh, what separates you from the pack is is your love and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learn from you, and I'm so fucking excited. I know uh, for you wow. and and what you're doing lately, and what you're going to do in season two. And thank you, my brother. 100%. Let's talk soon, buddy. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Let's let's uh, let's do this in real life. Okay, I love it, man. Anytime. All right, Bob. Bye, bye. Bye, fellas.